All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. Looks a little strange probably what I have on the screen right now, but what I wanted to show you was a three-legged stool. Yes, I really did. Why? Because web development really is a three-legged stool. We've talked about two of the legs so far. We've talked about HTML and HTML5, which allows you to add content to your web page. Allows you to put in lists and paragraphs and headers and divs, etc. All that good stuff. Then we went in and we talked about how to use presentation with that content. All right, and that was the CSS portion. Now we're going into JavaScript, and that kind of brings a website to life, for lack of better words. All right, it allows interactivity to take place in a website. Now, the book that we're using for JavaScript is called JavaScript 6th Edition. It's the Web Warrior series by Sasha Vodnik and Don Gosselin. Here's a picture of the book. If I do try to bring, well, I guess I won't bring it up that way then, fine. If I do bring up, I've got the book here, and when I say here, I've got it where... I can get a copy of it, an electronic copy of it, and that's what you're seeing right now. But what I want to quickly, a lot quicker than I'm doing, is show you is the fact that this book has 12 chapters. First, we get an introduction to JavaScript, followed by working with functions, data types, and operators, building arrays and control flow, debugging and error handling, working with a document object model, also known as the DOM and HTML, or DHTML, enhancing and validating forms. Why that won't leave, but it won't leave. Using object-oriented JavaScript, manipulating data in strings and arrays, Well, I'd like to show you the rest, but for whatever reason, this is getting hung up right now. the long contents, managing states, information, and security, programming for touch screens and mobile devices, updating web pages with AJAX, and an introduction to jQuery. Now, there is no way in heck that we're going to be able to get through a 14-chapter book on HTML and CSS and still have time to go through a 12-chapter book on JavaScript. So I'm going to do the PowerPoint lectures for all 12 of these chapters. That said, we will go over chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, and chapter six. So the first six chapters, probably chapter eight, and then we're going to do chapter 12. So I'm going to skip chapter seven, which is on object-oriented JavaScript, and I'm going to skip nine, 10, and 11. Now we may say something about chapter 10, which is on mobile devices, all right? And I didn't mean to waste your time doing that, but I wanted to give you an intro to let you know what's going on. All right? So with that said, let's jump into the PowerPoints for Chapter 1. Now, there might come a time in here, I don't know, where the author says one thing, and I don't necessarily agree with what the author said or how it says it. All right, but I'm sure Vodnik and Gosselin have got a lot more experience in this area than I do. So, our objectives. Number one, explain the history of the World Wide Web. Number two, explain the difference between client-side and server-side scripting. 
Number three, understand the components of a JavaScript statement. Number four, add basic JavaScript code to your programs. And number five, structure your JavaScript programs. All right, the World Wide Web is now over 50 years old. It was set up first as a project to allow the Defense Department to communicate with one another. It quickly morphed into something where it was also used so that universities could communicate with one another. Tim Berners-Lee is kind of known as the father of the internet. He saw a way using hypertext linking, as mentioned here, to be able to reference different documents. The web and the internet, are, they are used synonymously, but they're not the same thing. The internet is part of the World Wide Web. All right, what makes everything go are hyperlinks. You click on a hyperlink to get to a page, you type some kind of a web address into an address bar to get to a page. Pages are documents that are on the web. Each web page has its own unique, or at least each website has its own unique web address, also known as a URL or a uniform resource locator. Uniform resource locators are part of something bigger that's known as a uniform resource identifier. All right, so what's a website? As mentioned, it's a location on the internet that contains all sorts of stuff, web pages that contain text, that contain images, etc. The web browser is the program that you use for displaying web pages from a website on screen. The web server is when you go and you request something from a website, there is a web server that attempts to honor that request. So this whole thing is done over the hypertext transfer protocol. You using your browser, make it a hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP request that goes to a web server that may be able to service your request directly itself or may have to push your request out to yet another server, for example, a database server. But eventually the requested information comes back to the original web server, which has to put it into an HTML format that can be understood by the browser, and then it sends that back as an HTTP or hypertext transfer protocol response. All right, a little bit about web browsers. You may or may not remember this, but back in the mid-90s, Netscape was the browser. All right, then Microsoft Internet Explorer in 96, over 20 years ago, joined the market. And we had browser wars, where both um, Microsoft and Netscape tried to put new features out with each new version and quite often these were features were put out in a different manner so they weren't exactly compatible with one another. In 1994 the W3C or the World Wide Web Consortium was established and that was established as an overseer so in other words it was supposed to be in charge of everything web. The problem with that is You've ever heard the saying about the tail wagging the dog? Around that time, in the, the mid to late 90s, Netscape and Microsoft were coming up with features faster than the W3C could even come up with guidelines. All right. Today, the major browsers, I'd say that Chrome is probably the major one. Firefox, Internet Explorer, there's Opera, there's, there are other ones also. So... Web pages are made up of HTML. We already we started the lecture by talking about this. HTML is not a programming language, it's a markup language. As it says, it's a set of characters or symbols that define a document's logical structure. HTML is based on SGML, the standard generalized markup language. SGML was such a what's the word I'm looking for? SGML was such a gen general language that nothing ever really came of it, but it was used as a baseline for other languages such as HTML. HTML follows a syntax. Everything is tag-based. 
most tags, but not all, have a beginning tag and an ending tag. Some tags, like a BR tag or an HR tag or an image tag or an input tag, are called empty elements. They do not require a closing tag. On an HTML page, you've got your doc type at the top, followed by your HTML tag. HTML is the root element. Everything is contained under it. The HTML element has two elements underneath it. It's got the head element, says they're information used by the browser. In other words, it's information that does not appear directly on the page, and the body element, which has the information that is directly on the page. All right, some common HTML elements. Article is a new one because article is associated with HTML5. We've looked at body tags before, divs, head, head, the head section, h1, h2, h3, h4, h5, and h6, the HTML tag, the image tag, nav, which is another basically a new HTML5 tag, and p for paragraphs. So we've looked at a lot of these. All right, I don't know if it'll let me blow that up. I guess it does a little bit, but not so much. That's a typical web page right there. All right, now I could copy this stuff directly. Would it look like this? The answer is no, because I don't have the favicon, so that wouldn't show up here. I don't have any images, so they wouldn't show. But the, the main structure, yes, I could just copy it directly. I believe we've talked about this before, but just in case we have not, you can always go when you bring up a web, a web page and right mouse click on it, and when you right mouse click, it'll bring up that context sensitive menu. And one of the things that's not here, because I don't want to get out right now of, um, out of PowerPoint, but one of the things at the bottom will say view page source. And that will show you all of the HTML that makes up the page. All right. HTML documents are text documents. You can create them in any text editor. I use Notepad++ a lot. I've used brackets. Uh, and there, there's other ones that you can use as well. You can even use very sophisticated IDEs, an integrated development environment like Adobe Dreamweaver or Microsoft Visual Studio, which very much will automate the process because it's graphically oriented. Typical text edit editors are non-graphical. They may use color coding. Here again are some, these, this is not at all an exhaustive list. What is important about the ones that are shown on the screen here, Aptana, Komodo, Notepad++, and Text Wrangler, is they're free. All right, HTML5 is the most current version of HTML. We had HTML1 through HTML version 4.1, and around that time, XML started to become popular. XML was, was kind of a, supposed to be, a replacement, although some books say it wasn't, but I always think it was, for HTML. And XHTML, the extensible hypertext mark, text markup language, was meant to kind of be a bridge from HTML to XML. XML is not a bad language, but a lot of people are confused by it. So probably a good 10 years ago, if not more, the people from the W3C and other groups got together, and that's where HTML5 began. All right, make a distinction here between web page design and web page authoring. You know, if you work for a small enough shop, you do everything. You're the, you do the development, you do the design, you do basically everything there is to be done. Clients. Client server architecture, if we look here, the only thing I don't like about this picture is what they should have done is added to it because today more people are using mobile devices than are using non-mobile devices. And in this picture of a client server architecture, they're showing just the client being a laptop or a desktop. So we really should add, there should probably be four pictures here, a laptop, a desktop, a tablet, and a phone. All right. With a typical two-tier system, client-server architecture, you've got a client or a server. The client is you sitting at your browser. 
The server is what answers your browser requests. The server is also known as the back end. It does the work behind the scenes. You typically don't see the work involved in it. Typical back ends are PHP, um, ASP.NET, JSP, okay? And front ends are what we see. It's the user interface. As it says, it gathers information from the user and submits it to the server. The web is built on a two-tier client-server system. That's that HTTP client request and that HTTP server response that I mentioned to you earlier. You can also have a three-tier system, and that's really how most of them are, where you send information to a server, but it probably can't handle all your requests, so it sends it out to another server. Notice that in both cases, all the arrows go in both directions. What we've done thus far in here is we've worked with status, static rather web pages. Static web pages, as mentioned here, are web pages that not only cannot but do not change after the browser renders them. Most of the time, not always, but most of the time, when you have web pages that end with .html, they're static documents. What we're going to bring into this now is JavaScript to bring in the interactivity to our web pages, which brings in interactivity to our website. JavaScript, by and large, is a client-side server language that runs on the browser. There is server-side JavaScript, but we're not going to get into that in this class. The scripting engine executes the scripting language code, and the browsers contain the scripting engine. Very quick little history on JavaScript. Again, it's around 22, 23 years old. I think this was around 95. All right, it was first introduced by, I believe, Netscape Navigator, and it was originally called LiveScript. But with the advent of Java, the Java programming language coming out at that time, they changed the name from LiveScript to JavaScript. Probably would have been better off keeping it as LiveScript, but hey, doesn't matter. Unlike HTML, HTML5, CSS, and CSS3, which more or less are under the control of the W3C or the World Wide Web Consortium, JavaScript is under control of the ECMA or the European Computer Manufacturers Association. All right. It says here JavaScript cannot be used outside the web browser, not totally true anymore. Cannot run system commands or execute programs on a client. Again, not totally true anymore. <clears throat> So JavaScript is what we're going to use for front-end processing. The server-side scripting, some of the ones that you use on the back-end, again, PHP, ASP.NET, Python, Ruby, JSP. With server-side scripting, you can develop interactive websites that allow you to communicate not just with a database. Okay. So this is what we're going to be working with. All right, we won't directly be interfacing with a web server unless we use the, a product like XAMPP where we have the web server is handling, our, our, where our, our machine is handling both the client and the server side. Should you use client side or server side scripting? Yes. The answer is typically what you want to do is you want to validate anything you do on the client side so you don't want to send it over to the server before it's been validated because if, it's, if you're missing something, then the server has to do some work, say, oh, you're missing something, and send it back to the client. But you should perform as much processing as you possibly can on the client side. All right. Basic procedures used for adding JavaScript. Well, you can add JavaScript in three ways, just like you can add Cascading style sheets in three ways where you had inline, internal, and external. Guess what? You have inline, you have internal, and you have external JavaScript. With inline JavaScript, you oftentimes put it, you know, you might put it in the body tag, for example. With internal JavaScript, you've got script tags instead of style tags like you have with CSS, but the script tags are typically at the top of the program, can be at the bottom, all right? And with external, tags, instead of having a link tag, you've got a 
script tag. JavaScript is made up of many components, including objects. Again, we're not going to really get into this. I'm going to go over that chapter because I'm, I'm going over all 12 chapters of the PowerPoints. But in the classroom, we're not going to be going over objects. What objects are is they're a combination of data and methods that can operate on those data. All right. Data are also known as attributes, okay, and methods are also known as behaviors or really procedures. The data is also known as properties, okay. Properties can have arguments passed into them and they can pass arguments out of them. All right, let's take a look at a little bit of built-in JavaScript. One of the objects that we're going to use, we will do some object orientation, but it'll be limited. And one is the document object. As it says, the document object represents the content of the browser window. They allow you to write, the, for example, for example document.write allows you to write right to the web page. Here is an example. So if you put these two things in here, it would write this information right out to your web page. Key thing about JavaScript, it is case sensitive. Just get used to making virtually everything lowercase and you're best off. Now that's me speaking and I'm biased, but that's the way I've been doing it for years. JavaScript allows you to have comments. If you have a single line comment and you put in two forward slashes, anything to the, on that same line to the right of the two forward slashes is ignored by the JavaScript interpreter and it's treated as a comment. If you start a comment with a slash star and you end it with a star slash, you can have a multiple line comment. All right, when we start working with JavaScript code, okay, we're going to start with variables. What's a variable? Well, here's the author's definition. But I'm going to give you my own, which is pretty much an offshoot of that. And a variable is a named memory location whose contents may vary, hence the name variable. Values in a program are stored in computer men memory, and the names they're given are their variable names. You can assign values to variables. When you create your own stuff, so to speak, in JavaScript, your own variables, your own functions, your own methods, your own routines, your own whatever, what you name things are what are known as identifiers. So that's things that you name. Identifiers must begin with either an uppercase or a lowercase letter. Again, I'd suggest lowercase. You can also begin them with a dollar sign or an underscore. I wouldn't recommend the underscore because there are system variables that begin with underscores. I would not recommend using the dollar sign at the beginning because that's how PHP variables are listed. And if you're ever going to do any code that intermixes PHP and JavaScript, it can be a little confusing. You can use numbers and identifiers, but it can't be the first character. You can't have spaces, and you can't have reserved words, which we'll see on the next slide. Reserved words are a special part of the JavaScript language, and here they are. We're going to go over many of these as we go on. Not all of them, and some of these, some of these um, reserved words were literally created as reserved words so you couldn't use them. Things like go to which is, you know, a word that we should just avoid in most programming languages. All right. One thing about JavaScript, give you my own quick little um, analogy here, that for years I've been trying to learn to play the guitar. All right. And I had a friend years ago who got me into this, and he was, is a very good, good guitarist. He played electric guitar. He also played, played acoustic guitar, but he basically played electric guitar and he was in a band. All right. He only, I, I asked him once, I said, you know, what, have you ever been out playing in a band and one of your strings broke? You know, and he said, yeah. I said, what do you do? He said, typically I turn up the amp. It's like if, if the amp is up loud enough, all right, if the amp is up loud enough, 
Um, even if I screw up, it's harder to, 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 to hear that. On the other hand, he played out a few times where he had an acoustic guitar. And if he screwed up with that, you knew. So why am I telling you this? Most programming languages, not JavaScript, but most programming languages are like an electric guitar. I'll say that again because I screwed it up. Most programming languages, not JavaScript, most pro programming languages, no, they're like an acoustic guitar. They have very set rules that if you don't follow them, you could have devastating consequences that you see right away. JavaScript is more like an electric guitar. JavaScript allows you to be very sloppy with the way you program. I'm not going to allow that, but JavaScript does. When you create a variable, you should use the word var followed by the variable name, and you probably will want to give it an initial value. With JavaScript, if you don't declare a variable, and that's what this is, that's a variable declaration, and that would be a variable initialization. All right, and you can combine them together, or you can do them as two different lines. But with most programming languages, if you don't initialize a variable at least before you use it, you get an error. With some programming languages, if you don't initialize and, I'm sorry, with most programming languages, if you don't declare a variable before you use it, you get an error. With most of those languages, not only do you have to declare the variable, but you have to initialize it. With JavaScript, you neither have to declare nor initialize a variable. When you first start to use it, it gets a value. You use the equal sign in JavaScript, as in most programming languages, as assignment. One single equal sign means assign. So if I say, if this would have said var name equals 21, that means take the value 21 and a, so var age, I should say, equal 21, that would take the value 21 and assign it to the variable age. When you print out variables, you don't put them in double quotes. So if I want to say your sales total is, and my sales total was 47.58, I put this your sales total is and the dollar sign in double quotes, because that's a string, that's the 47.58, and that's the end of my paragraph. Now, a lot of this may not make sense right now, but that's what the rest of the JavaScript portion of the class is about. You use that plus sign, that we just looked at there, it means concatenation. Sometimes when you use the plus sign, it means addition. When you've got an operator, like a plus sign, that can mean one thing in one situation and another thing in another situation, and the system figures out what it means based on context, that's what's known as an overloaded operator. It can perform more than one task. All right. With variables, you can, you can create them anywhere in your script. You can change them anywhere in your script by just giving them a different value. So here we're setting sales total equal to 47.58, and here we're resetting it to that 47.58 plus the $10 for shipping. So it's now 57.58. The JavaScript programming language, like most prog programming languages, rather, is made up of a bunch of different stuff, such as expressions. So if I say var x equals y plus z, that's an expression. Operands and operators are what are inside of expressions. So if I say var x equals y plus z, the y and the z are operands. The plus sign is an operator. If I say var age equal 21, that 21 is a literal. JavaScript, like many other programming languages, is an object, I'm sorry, an event-driven programming language. So in other words, look at it this way, that you write yourself a JavaScript program and JavaScript is sitting there waiting to react to whatever you told it to react to by putting some code there. Here are some of the events that we'll discuss in here. The blur event, when you go from one control to another. The change event, depend, and that's different depending on the type of control you're working with. The click event, when you click something. Error, when an error occurs. Focus, when a control gets the focus or the cursor is put there. Key down, when you press a key. Key up, when you release the key. Load, when something loads into memory. 
mouse out when you take the mouse and so for instance now this is my mouse over right now there's a mouse out reset when you want to set a form back to default values select as it says when you select something submit when you click a submit button on a form and the last three of these last four these three when they say is touch these are all dealing with mobile devices finally load is when you load something into memory unload is when you take it out what you'll find when we start talking about event handling is we'll work with elements and we'll work with events events are associated with elements event handlers are how you respond to an event happening you could if you add code to an event handler that code will fire when that event fires if you don't add code typically when the event fires nothing will happen here are some events I'm not going to go over any of them right now other than to tell you you'll notice that when you're talking about events they start with the word on typically not everyone in here but there are if there are 50 or 60 probably all of them except for tab key and access key I think all of the rest of these start with on we will use you will become intimate for lack of better words with the get element by ID method remember JavaScript is case sensitive so the G and get and the D and ID are lowercase the E and element the B and by and the I and ID are uppercase you must put it in like this if I made it all lowercase or all uppercase or if I put the D here in uppercase for example I get I typically don't get an error message it's just that it doesn't work the get element by ID is part of the document object so it'll be document dot get element by ID and what goes in those parentheses if you remember for our HTML I always said that when we, we created form elements and, and the like or paragraphs or whatever we gave them IDs that's where this get element by ID comes in as it says this allows for the retrieval of information about an element or the ability to change the values assigned to elements when you start thinking about how to structure JavaScript code there are certain rules that should be followed all right either you're going to have your JavaScript in an external file all right so it'll be in a file like an external CSS file that'll hold just JavaScript and then you'll put in what are called source uh, I'm sorry script tags in your HTML file or you can have internal JavaScript kind of like instead of using style tags like we used with CSS you'll now use beginning and ending script tags all right or like you have inline CSS you can have inline JavaScript we'll touch on all those as we go on in here some people believe that the script element when you put that in should be placed at the beginning of the document some feel it should be placed at the end what we're going to do by and large is put it at the end all right at the end of our body section before the ending body tag the reason for that is the head loads before the body okay so anything that your JavaScript needs from the head section should be loaded if you put your JavaScript at the bottom you have no guarantee if that's the case if you put your JavaScript in the head section I already mentioned creating an external JavaScript source file they must end with a .js extension rather JS for JavaScript all right and it contains just JavaScript the advantage just like the advantage of having your CSS in, a, in an external file having your JavaScript in an external file results in neater code the ability to share code the ability to hide code from incompatible browsers JavaScript has many built-in libraries the one that we're going to look at later after this JavaScript section and we'll look at also in like chapter 12 is jQuery but some of the newer ones are node.js backbone.js and modernizer libraries as mentioned here are especially useful because they have generic scripts that you can use and most of them are free 
validating parser, we've looked at validation. We actually looked at the W3C HTML parser. I don't know if there's exactly JavaScript parsers, but we'll look at some things similar to that as we go on. As it says, JavaScript statements contain symbols which can screw up XHTML, but should be handled okay by HTML. All right, I don't want to go over what this stuff is about. It's not stuff that we have to be concerned with. Other than to say, if you look right here, many people put these C data tags before their script tags. And the reason that they do that is to make sure as much as possible that the, if you have any XHTML, that the JavaScript doesn't break it. So we've come to the end of chapter one. I gave you a brief history of the World Wide Web, the you know, WWW in our websites. We talked about some of the differences between, between client-side and server-side scripting. We also looked at a client-server system, both a two-tier, which is a client and a single server, and a multi-tier with a client and a single server, which may be connected to all sorts of other servers. We talked about the components of a JavaScript statement. We looked very quickly on how to add basic JavaScript code to web pages. And again, I mentioned inline JavaScript, internal JavaScript, and external JavaScript. Finally, we learned how to structure our JavaScript programs. So that is it for chapter one. When I come back again, I will go into chapter two. And chapter two is going to be discussing some JavaScript functions. I'll be back with that shortly.